Cisco Electric here. Today is April 20th, 2024, and this is The Current, weekly EV news. I aim for this latest episode to be the most helpful 10 minutes of EV and electrification stories available anywhere. Australian fast charging hardware manufacturer Tritium has filed for insolvency, and their administrators are in search for a buyer. Tritium became a publicly traded stock via a special acquisition merger in January of 2022 with a $2 billion valuation. Recently, the value dropped below $4 million and the company was delisted from NASDAQ. Within the last year, they closed down their Brisbane plant to prioritize manufacturing in the U.S. in the Lebanon, Tennessee plant, where the output is eligible for government subsidies. Tritium says the Tennessee plant had a production capacity of up to 30,000 DC fast chargers per year on six production lines. The company has delivered 14,400 DC fast chargers in more than 47 countries, despite its notable partnerships with BP, Shell, Aqua Superpower, and Ionity, Along with its winning Nevi bids in Hawaii and Tennessee, it failed to operate profitably. A creditor meeting will be held by April 26th, which should provide more insight on Tritium's immediate future. This week, battery recycling firm Redwood Materials has provided an update on their progress, including their hydrometallurgy capabilities, activation of their rotary calciner, and commencement of battery anode copper foil production. They also revealed statistics from a life cycle analysis performed by Stanford University, quantifying the environmental advantages of their operation compared to traditional mining methods. They said, our hydrometallurgy facility, the first commercial scale nickel mine to open in the United States in a decade, not only recycles battery manufacturing scrap into raw nickel and cobalt, but also stands as the only commercial scale source of lithium supply to come online in the US in decades. Redwood Materials broke ground at their battery materials campus in Northern Nevada less than two years ago. Today, it is processing 30,000 tons of material annually, including end-of-life batteries and production scrap, and their current equipment will ramp to 60,000 tons or 15 gigawatt hours by the end of this year. Redwood Materials partners include Volkswagen, Ford, Toyota, Volvo, Panasonic, and e-mobility brands Specialized and Lyft. While we're on the topic of battery recycling, Chinese battery giant CATL has announced a recycling program with their partner Volvo. According to Volvo, suppliers like Redwood Materials would provide recycled materials to CATL, who will then use the materials for new battery production. CATL and Volvo signed a long-term multi-billion dollar agreement back in 2019 for CATL to provide lithium-ion batteries to Volvo and Polestar for the coming decade. Volvo plans to be an all-electric brand by 2030. A closed loop for battery materials has significant implications for the electrification supply chain and the domestic economic sovereignty of the United States. I'll continue to report on this as the technology develops. I'll link information below if you have some old batteries you want to recycle. A new wave of growth is on the horizon for both Tesla and Rivian, but it comes at a cost. Both American EV makers went through a round of layoffs this past week with some notable respected executives departing one of them. Let's start with Rivian. The electric adventure vehicle maker announced layoffs of 1% of their workforce, which equates to over 150 employees. This is the third round of layoffs for them in six months. Over 1,500 jobs were cut in February of 2024. A shift in workforce composition makes sense considering Rivian paused long-standing plans to build a large-scale manufacturing facility in Georgia. They are currently in the process of establishing production for the upcoming R2 at the Normal Illinois facility. This move has been estimated to represent savings of $2 billion. Tesla's layoffs included over 10% of their workforce, affecting about 14,000 workers globally. Two top executives, Vice President of Public Policy and Business Development, Rohan Patel, who had been with Tesla for eight years, and Senior Vice President of Powertrain and Energy, Drew Baglino, who had been with Tesla for 18 years, also announced they were leaving. Elon has stated that the company added jobs too quickly, and that this kind of pairing is required every five years or so. Tesla's renewed focus on full self-driving autonomy and a forthcoming robo-taxi division will require a rebalancing of skills and experience in the workforce. Labor is a significant expense for any automaker, and as the rate of growth has declined, these adjustments are required. 
Tesla and Rivian have more flexibility as organizations in this regard compared to automakers like Ford and GM, which are bound to long-term rigid union contracts. Yesterday, workers voted to unionize a team of over 4,000 at Volkswagen's plant in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The factory which produces the ID4 EV and the VW Atlas is the first to unionize in the South. The next vote planned is at a Mercedes-Benz plant in Vance, Alabama, which produces several all-electric EQ models. They currently employ over 6,000 workers. To remain competitive, automakers must manage all costs associated with production. One major advantage offered by electric vehicles is simplicity. They have far fewer parts and require a fraction of the labor hours to manufacture. Recent union renegotiations with Ford, GM, and Stellantis have not only raised the hourly rate to over $150, but also mandated the size of the workforce. This means that even if those companies kept their promises and timelines going all electric, they would be unable to realize any of those labor savings. Subsequently, all three of those automakers have announced suspensions or delays of many EV programs. Workers' rights are important. A healthy and competitive U.S. auto industry is also important. Our government has heavily subsidized the largest American car makers with tax dollars for generations. Countries like China are doing the same. One major advantage they have is a leaner and more productive workforce with a higher use of robotics. The companies which are prohibited from innovating and reducing waste will not produce the best value for buyers. What are your thoughts on the complicated issue of factory labor? General Motors had a busy week in the news announcing they are moving their headquarters out of the iconic downtown Detroit Towers that they own and into a smaller building in a more populous part of downtown Detroit. In celebration, they displayed their electric models out front including the Hummer EV, Cadillac Lyric, Chevy Silverado EV, and Escalade IQ. They also announced the details and pricing on the GMC Sierra Denali EV. The all-electric pickup will be the third Ultium truck variant from General Motors and will offer an improved 440 miles of EPA range, which is a 10% improvement from previous estimates thanks to powertrain optimizations. They also improved its towing by 500 pounds, now reaching 10,000 pounds capacity and the payload increased by 150 pounds, achieving a total of 1,450 pound capacity. GMC dealers are accepting orders for the Sierra EV Denali Edition 1 pickup up with deliveries beginning this summer. Prices will start at $97,500 with less expensive versions of the Sierra EVs available at a later date. So far, the GMC Sierra EV Denali is my favorite Ultium pickup truck. I'm looking forward to driving one in the future. GM's energy division is now shipping their vehicle to home or V2H bundle. It includes the necessary hardware to enable the transfer of energy between a customer's compatible EV and a properly equipped home. The first compatible EV is the 2024 Chevy Silverado EV RST. Pricing for the bundle starts around $5,600 and goes up to $12,700, excluding taxes, installation, and federal incentives, depending on the bundle you choose. Initial availability is limited to California, Florida, Michigan, New York, and Texas. GM claims they'll expand V2H technology across its portfolio of Ultium-based EVs by model year 2026. Additional residential solutions, including stationary energy storage and solar integration, will be available later this year. I'll link more information in the description below. Maserati has taken the cover off their latest all-electric offering, and it's a drop top. The Maserati Gran Cabrio Fulgora is based on the same 800-volt electric architecture as its sibling, the Gran Turismo Fulgora and includes technology and advancements that Maserati has learned with their participation in Formula E, the FIA's all-electric open-wheel racing series. It includes three radial flux permanent magnet motors delivering peak power up to 818 horsepower with its max boost mode and 996 pound-feet of torque. It can achieve 0 to 62 miles per hour in just 2.8 seconds. Its T-shaped battery pack is 92.5 kilowatt hours in gross capacity with 83 kilowatt hours usable. It also has regenerative braking capabilities of up to 400 kilowatts with sensitivity adjustments via the paddle shifters on the steering wheel. The Gran Cabrio's charging speeds hit up to 270 kilowatts and includes a DC booster for compatibility on lower voltage charging stations. Pricing, EPA range, and delivery times for the US market have not yet been confirmed. 
For months, Maserati has been selling their two EVs, the Gran Turismo Fulgore and Grecale Fulgore in Europe. Maserati has committed to becoming an all-electric brand in 2028. Out of the three convertibles expected to hit the market in the coming years, which would you go for? The Maserati Grand Cabrio Fulgore, Genesis X Convertible, or the Polestar 6? I'm ready for some more electric convertibles to hit the market. Back in October of 2022, Honda announced they would convert their Ohio plants into EV manufacturing facilities, calling the place the Honda EV Hub. This week, they said they are ahead of schedule. Honda now plans to start production of EVs at the Marysville Auto Plant by the end of 2025 instead of 2026. Their joint battery cell factory with LG Energy Solutions will also start production by the end of 2025 with an annual production capacity of around 40 gigawatt hours. Honda's abandonment of future production partnerships with GM may have allowed them to move faster towards capturing EV subsidies and incentives. This year at the Consumer Electronics Show, I was able to see the Honda's zero concepts, including the saloon. A production vehicle based on the saloon concept was expected to come to the North American market in 2026 and will be reportedly built out of the Ohio EV hub. Honda also has a partnership with Sony to build the Afila electric sedan. Previously, Sony Honda Mobility, their joint venture, has said it aimed to start accepting orders for the Afila in 2025, with U.S. deliveries to start in 2026. The Afila will also be built at the Ohio EV Hub. Honda has taken uncharacteristic risks with their EV design concepts, and they've committed to taking those wild ideas to production. Will they arrive earlier than expected? Well, that's all for this week's edition of The Current. We would love to keep making these and will continue to do so if we see growing viewership. So please consider subscribing and sharing this video if you found some value in this coverage. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, drive, fly, ride, go electric.